our time to introduce ourselves. So I am Raywin, um, and this is Despina. And Despina is a nutritional therapist for WellWorks. And a certified functional medicine practitioner and a bulletproof human potential coach. There we go. Yes. Yeah, in very, very good hands. And um, she's been through the whole rigmarole of food allergy testing. And decided to host this Q&A because more and more people are coming up to us and asking us questions about, do I need a food allergy test? Um, or I've had a food allergy test and I'm allergic to everything. And, you know, I thought there needs to be a few, um, you know, right. to drop in a few pearls of wisdom around what that means, what does a food allergy test actually mean, and how can we actually um, help people understand the difference between sensitivity and tolerance and allergy, allergy right. what's a true allergy. Um, so Nick opened for us a little while ago, for, for those who haven't joined, uh, who missed, missed um, the, the start of this, and uh, Nick is in Trinidad, and he's, had, um, uh, he's currently very reactive to lots and lots of foods, but it's only been since he's been on some very strong antibiotics some years ago and also anesthesia. So Despina, I want to ask some questions around that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think that happened to him? Because the immune system has gone a little bit crazy. Usually like you have a really nice table that you put together on food allergies um, versus the intolerances and the allergies start when people are young and they're allergic to things like peanuts. You're, friend Nicholas had this happen now and so something triggered that to take place and the antibiotics are definitely a big one because we say most of our immunity is in the gut and with the antibiotics hitting all the bugs the good bugs and the bad bugs you get a lot of dysbiosis happening and that can cause a lot of inflammation and that can cause a lot of immune dysregulation so explain dysbiosis, because I feel like that's a right. word most people are not familiar with. They might be familiar with terms like leaky gut, but maybe we should just clarify yeah. what that means, what dysbiosis means and leaky gut. Right. So a lot of people don't recognize that what we eat is what our bugs eat. And so if for years and years and years, we have diets that are very high in simple carbs, that causes a lot of the bad bugs to flourish and a lot of the good bugs actually die off. And then that means that there's an imbalance between the good and the bad guys. And so we want to eat really healthy vegetables and complex carbs and healthy fats to keep the good guys really robust and to make sure that our immunity stays high that way. Because when it doesn't, then we get possibly parasites if we go away and drink contaminated water. We don't have that robust immunity in our gut to keep things balanced. So okay. dysbiosis is when the bad bugs overpower the good guys. When the good bugs are out of whack, that means that the gut then becomes a space that is hosting or very hospitable to bad bugs and right. to parasites and those kinds of things. Dysbiosis is essentially an imbalance. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And many people have that in today's world due to the fact that they eat a lot of fast food and food that doesn't feed the good bacteria. Okay. Right. And then also, like you were saying, because of the antibiotics and because of eating a lot of food that can cause irritation and inflammation in the gut. Mm -hmm. And those are things like dairy for some people, wheat for some people, um, et cetera. Then that can cause what we call the leaky gut syndrome, which again allows for particles to kind of go through the gut without being fully digested and then causing immune reaction because the soldiers out there, um, our immune system, feel like, oh no, this is a foe. This is someone that we need to destroy. And it becomes very overactive and that causes a lot of this type of inflammation. Not, reactivity. And reactivity. So yeah. like in Nick's case where he is, you know, he says he's reactive to everything. It sounds like his immune system is um, overstimulated, yeah, yeah. hypervigilant, overstimulated. It and could it, be because of the dysbiosis and the leaky gut at the moment. Yeah. So that's why we recommend that everyone looks at their gut integrity first and looks at what's happening in the gut in terms of are there parasites, are there worms, are there an overpopulation of the bad bugs before going into these types of food intolerance tests because I did that day one before I even studied nutrition thinking that it was going to help me because I was feeling bloated and uncomfortable and I reacted to everything under the sun. And it wasn't really that 
I was allergic to everything. It was just that I did have leaky gut at the time. So I tell everyone, go through a 5R protocol for healing the gut, which is removing all the things that cause our gut to have inflammation, like the bad food, like the, a lot of sugar, a lot of gluten, a lot of dairy, um, and then replacing with things like digestive enzymes and lemon and apple cider vinegar that really help us digest our food and even chewing a lot more and mindfully and eating with people in a good space, etc. cetera. Um, and then re-inoculating with things like probiotics, repairing with a lot of antioxidants like zinc and vitamin C, and then rebalancing. So going through that 5R program for four to six weeks, and then if you still have symptoms, then maybe look at food intolerance testing. But like we spoke about, the symptoms are not just always bloating or gas. It could be GERD. It could be achy joints. Yeah, it so, could be headaches. Yeah, so yeah. GERD, for anybody who doesn't know, is um, it's basically acid reflux. So, in, yeah, in layman's terms. Um, so, yeah, it could be joint inflammation. You could feel tired after right. you eat. And that's one thing I always ask people to, to calm. They say, oh, I don't know if this makes me feel good or not. I was like, well, Notice how, you know, do you feel tired? Yeah, because food should give us energy. energy. It shouldn't make us feel like we want to take a nap. Yeah, exactly. If you feel tired after you eat, it's probably not food that you should be eating, right? right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or mood swings or, you know, lots of yeah. highs and lows. <laughs> yeah. So the symptoms don't have to be gut symptoms. That's it could be other symptoms. So I think hives and skin rashes and psoriasis is a really common one that people don't always link to, exactly. to food. Yeah. Um, that, that's one that I see a lot of. And the second that we cut out dairy or we cut out gluten and we minimize you know, simple sugars, people start, the inflammation response goes down, their skin starts to improve. And then we you know, look at supplementation of things like omegas and like you said, right. zinc and yeah. high strength vitamin C. And, and that once kind of you do repair the gut, yeah. then maybe you could introduce some of these foods in smaller quantities and be okay with them. Yes. It doesn't have to be a forever thing. Yes. But first you need to actually heal the gut before you can do it. Yeah, so I think, um, oh, so Nick is saying, I started fasting, but every time I'd refeed with just Brussels sprouts, my skin would break out. So I went on an elimination diet, and now I'm stuck on a carnivore diet as my safe zone. So it looks like vegetables. Right, so it could be even something like SIBO, small yes. intestinal bacteria Cereal overgrowth. overgrowth. Sometimes when people don't do well with vegetables, it could be that there's overgrowth of good bacteria, but on the upper part of the intestine. So maybe some more testing would be something that would be helpful. Yeah. Or in terms of gut testing and small intestinal. Yeah. Testing. yeah. So, um, and for anyone who was curious about the SIBO test, it's actually a breath test. So it's not a stool test. Um, the usual gut health test that we would run would be the GI would be the GI map. Um, and that looks at the lower intestine, so it doesn't look at the one. Whereas the SIBO, you, you do this breath test, right. and it looks at the releasing of the yeah. tongue. But the reality <laughs> is that even with something like a GI map, we do get an idea if something might be going wrong. Mm -hmm. So people with SIBO, some of them, for example, have helicobacter pylori mm -hmm. in there. You can still see that in the GI map, or you see low elastate, so they don't have the pancreatic enzymes to digest and absorb all their nutrients. They could have high steatocrit, again, not breaking down their fats properly. So there could be some signs, even by doing the GI map, that we can see that something might be going wrong, and then further test for placebo. So... In your opinion, do you think food allergy testing should be a first port of call? No, I think it makes people confused about what they can and cannot eat. Mm -hmm. And it's too soon to tell because if we don't know the health of the gut, then we really can't tell what foods are actually something that's intolerant for them. Um, and I, I think I'm with you on that because I've heard of people who, like you, like you who have... Um, Done become, that yeah, as a first port of call. Have done that as a first port of call, and then they're very, like you said, very overwhelmed, very depressed, and sad about the fact that I can't eat anything anymore. What am I meant to eat? And um, that is that's never a good place to be either, because then that does get the immune system into an even worse state. Because then you're like, 
right? Because stress, stress is one of the worst things for dysbiosis. Stress is one of the biggest triggers of, of a, a unhappy gut, you know? Yeah. So if you're putting the body under physical stress by foods that irritate it, and then if you put it under psychological stress, then you're more likely to have these kinds of symptoms as well. Now, I know that it's all, you know, and a lot of the clients that you and I both work with, they're, you know, corporate workers, they're in high-paced environments, very intense. Um, they don't get to eat very slowly ever. Sometimes they don't ever eat on time either. And they're kind of on, I call it like a treadmill or a hamster wheel. They're just kind of running, 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 running around and um, don't really ever get a chance to breathe or to break their food down properly because when they sit down, they inhale right, their food. They're always in a rush. Always in a rush and they don't chew. And then afterward they wonder, well, why am I bloated? Why am I uncomfortable? But then some, and when they eat bread or let's say they have coffee or sometimes coffee can be a trigger as well, caffeine can be. Um, why do I feel so uncomfortable? But then when they go on a holiday, they say, well, when I'm on holiday, I seem to be fine. And I can eat bread and I can eat dairy and I can have coffee and enjoy it. And it doesn't give me the jitters or I don't feel ill or I don't feel, I don't have brain fog and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's really useful to understand that stress, it's important for everybody to get that stress can be a very big part of what is going on with people's symptoms. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And mindful eating and trying really, really hard to breathe and take your time eating your food and chewing is super important. And if they can't do it during the day, then at least do it at dinner time when they come home. Mm -hmm. Um, and another thing is that you know, people forget that digestion doesn't begin with, um, with when the food is in front of them and it's in their mouth. It begins when you start looking at the food or thinking about the food, smelling the, smelling food. the food, your senses start digestion. You know, that, that right. begins, the enzymes that, are activated. They become, yeah. yeah, that process begins. And when we're relaxed, but when we're stressed, we are not breathing properly. And by not doing that, now nervous systems are stimulated. We're not producing enough saliva. And we know that saliva is one of the first things that we need in order to be able to digest food properly and to assimilate. So digestion is about assimilation as well. We want to be able to absorb our nutrients. If we're not doing that, we're not being mindful before we eat, we're not pausing, we're not allowing juices to flow right. quite literally. Um, then, and if we know that's the case, then maybe we should take some digestive enzymes. So if we know we're going to have a stressful day and we're mm -hmm. going to be in meetings, then always eat our food with digestive enzymes. And wrap help. up with probiotics at the end of it as well. So, right. so that, um, that, I think, is probably a message that I was very, really keen to get across. Because like I said, I'm getting a lot, a lot of questions about, I want to get a food allergy test because I'm reacting to all these foods. And even though the, my, the quick answer would be like, sure, we can do that for you. That's not getting to the root of the problem. And the entire premise behind what we do and behind the, you know, the functional medicine framework is for us to get to the root of the problem and to understand why you're reacting to these foods, not just what foods you're reacting to. So what is not so important, more why. So Nick says, I feel fine on the carnivore and I sleep great and my skin clears completely but I feel like I'm just avoiding the problem instead of fixing it. And that's exactly what we're saying, that we need to find out why, Nick, you, um, why you're reacting in this way. And yes, if it was since the surgery, something definitely happened with the combination of the anesthetic and with the antibiotics. Um, but we don't know what, we don't know the state of your gut. So, and yeah. you don't, yeah. It's just been triggered and mm -hmm. we need to look specifically on what bugs have overpopulated do you have any viruses do you have any uh, yeast or fungus um, and all this we can see with the gi map so we can then create a specific protocol that's going to work for you because we know what the numbers are and what we need to bring it back into balance mm -hmm. so the um, insight that you get from doing a gut health test probably going to be more useful for you than doing just a food allergy test in a nutshell. That's what you know, the food allergy test, like we said, it's only going to tell you what it's not going to tell you why. Right. Yeah. But even after we bring the body back into balance, we need to remind everybody that it's important to eat the rainbow and to eat different types of food throughout your week. So even if you love chicken and broccoli, mm -hmm. You can't have chicken and broccoli every day because you need different nutrients from different colors of the plant kingdom. 
and different um, meat has different proteins that are helpful. Different fish have different minerals that are helpful. So we really want to have a variety on our plate day in and day out. Yeah, as much as possible eating different things, even because I, I think that's one of the funny things about food allergy tests. Um, yeah, if you're always eating, eating the one same food. thing, that's the food that's going to show up in the test. Right. And that's why it's very confusing for people because they're like, well, wait, that's the food that I like. Why am I allergic <laughs> to it? Um, and not confusing, depressing. I feel, I feel more depressed than confused. Um, so, so yeah, so that's one to, to be mindful of. Um, I know we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any other questions, Asia, do you have any questions for us? Cause I feel like anything. Okay. No, um, Nick, you're saying that I've been, you've been on the carnivore for eight months, but, um, yeah, but if, the thing is, if you haven't healed the gut, because there's clearly something else going on there, the being on the carnival where the inflammation has had a chance, should have had a chance to settle down. Right. But, but it's you, not just a matter of eating non-inflammatory foods, because once we've already caused the disruption in the gut, we need to fix it first, and then we can stick with the non-inflammatory foods. Yeah. But also, I mean, meat is inflammatory in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not causing certain immune reactions that are allowing Nick to see all these symptoms, but it could be causing other inflammatory processes if you're eating tons of meat all day, every mm -hmm. day. He fasts a lot. So that's, that's one thing. Good. I think he sort of like eats one meat and then, and then fast for like two days and stuff like that. Right, Nick, you, you fast for a while, usually like 48 hours sometimes. That's really good. So, um, so just in terms of what's a true allergy and then what's a sensitivity, if let's say we've gone through a gut health protocol and we've done the, you know, the, the four or five stages of that five R, the five R and we go through that and six weeks are up and our six weeks or even 12 weeks, let's say we keep yeah. them on it for 12 weeks. Cause I, I'm a person who likes 90 days cause I know the body takes that, up that much time to get over stuff. And we're all different and we're yeah. all different. Exactly. So the longer you can be on something like that probably the better but 90 days we get through that and then we start reintroducing certain foods and you know, by then we think that the should be in a good place because we've removed all the bad bugs and we've replaced with good things um and let's say we get through all that and then they're still having reactions so then what's the next step could possibly be to look at some of the um ig G sensitivity at mm -hmm. that point in time and see if there is a certain food it could be depending on you know where we grew up and where our genes are there are certain foods that are better for us than others so there could be certain foods that we need to not eat as much that's really interesting so you actually eat quite a bit pretty much too. definitely yeah, i cool. do that's why we see in the blue zones they're not eating the same diet but they are all living to be you know, past the hundred. In Japan, they eat tons of fish and tons of seaweed. In Mediterranean countries, olive oil and legumes, because and in their red wine, and red wine. <laughs> and red wine. <laughs> but their DNA has the enzymes needed to break down those particular foods. And so, yeah, that I know your friend was saying that he can eat bananas that are local, but not ones from somewhere else. And mm -hmm. it could be because they're grown in a different soil, and his DNA knows how to have the enzymes for their local area. That's why they always say like, even for honey, that we should always have the local, local honey. honey. That's yeah. true, I've heard that. Um, so IG, IgG tests are the food sensitivity tests. Right. And yeah. the IgE are the ones. And the IgE ones, yeah, yeah. That's the, so, that's when, so that's when you have a true allergy, that's when you're like at risk for anaphylaxis. Right. And, and that's all acute, that's, that's yeah. not something that you see after 72 hours. Or Right. Yeah. So, uh, so a true allergy is something that you're, you're born with and that you would have pretty much a reaction to straight away, either whether it's hives, you know, what you hive or, or coughing, or coughing yeah. wheezing, that kind of thing, very uncomfortable, like difficulty with breathing airways right. and that kind of thing and nausea yeah. usually, um, or sometimes even you know, actual vomiting, but the sensitivity and the intolerance side of things is where it can take up to 72 hours to show up. And it can show up in, you know, in the form of brain fog, mood swings, a rash, um, bloating, achiness, yeah. achiness um, you know, all, like you said, like a combination of 
of, of like neuropsychological as well as like physiological type symptoms. Right. Um, you were saying that you, it could be food, of course, but it could even be something like mold that yeah. people don't know that they have in their house or they start working in a new location mm. or going to a new school. And so environmental like, triggers right. in addition can trigger. And so mold can be a big trigger or even things like metals. Yeah, yeah. So, so food is probably the first thing we look at, but be mindful that if you know, things don't clear up in that way, you can do further tests. You can do yeah. further labs around you know, whether it's mold or whether it's um, toxicity. Because you know, toxicity is one that I think comes up a lot when people have amalgams, they're eating out yeah. of cans of tuna um, or, or whatever, you know, those, those sort of lots of tuna. Yeah, probably kind of related with no. fish in general. Well, that's when you become <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and you eliminate and keep going and investigate until yeah. you find the culprit. Yes. Um, and just for, um, how are you saying, two amalgams in one canal? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it doesn't sound like it could just be food. <laughs> yeah, lots of investigative work needed there for sure from the sounds of it. I urge anybody who's thinking that they might actually have a food sensitivity to actually start with looking at laying your gut first. Um, and we have a number of ways that we can help you do that. So feel free to jump on to well-works.uk, do our health assessment and get some one-on-one or one-on-one time with us. Yay! Yay. And then we can help you decipher the, um, the pieces of your health puzzle. So if there aren't any more questions, then and thank you. <laughs> no, thank you for being so gracious and, um, and generous with your information and your time. Um, and for everybody who jumped in and we're going to watch this replay, thank you for that as well. And we hope to, to see you soon. So we are here to help you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.